fitting uh, when Dr. Vila talks about fear of heel. It's kind of dark in here. <laughs> so uh, let me, um, it's my great honor to introduce Dr. James Dillers as our 2017, uh, fall 2017, Center for Health and Risk Communications Distinguished Speaker. Dr. Diller is a distinguished professor of communication arts and sciences at Penn State University. He is a former editor of Human Communication Research and co-editor of the legendary Persuasion Handbook, a fellow of the International Communication Association, a recipient of the first John E. Hunter Award for Meta Analysis, and the recipient of the NCA Golden Anniversary Award for Article of the Year. Dr. Dealer's scholarly interests focus on how communication produces change in the opinions and behaviors of others with special emphasis on the role of emotion. Dr. Dealer has published numerous groundbreaking foundational articles on persuasion and emotion. Dr. Dealer's talk today focuses on a new theory he developed with others, the alarm call theory, which considers how warning messages induce fear and how the dynamic properties of that emotion produce persuasion. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Diller. Thank you for that very gracious uh, and over-the-top introduction there. I appreciate it. I can see that the public relations part is rubbing off. Uh, well done. Uh, it's nice to be here uh, among the turtles. Um, I haven't been here, I guess, for 10 years or so. And uh, yeah, I see uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of change since I was last year. A lot of new buildings on campus, bright and shiny buildings. I got to stay in one last night uh, called the hotel. Uh, they told me I was probably the second person to stay in that room that was so new. And it, it had the new car smell about it. It was really quite a, quite a treat. Um, so it's, uh, it's been a great experience so far. And I hope we can make that happen for another hour. Um, I'd like to uh, talk to you about uh, a water call today. Um, what do I do? Issue some warning to the rest of them. 
or conspecific thing issued a alarm call. Um, the group then takes action of some sort uh, to remedy the problem, uh, running away or ultimately mobbing or something, but they take some kind of action. It turns out that this is a pattern that plays out in lots of different species, uh, not the least of which are homo sapiens. Um, we put up signs like this to warn others about uh, maybe the possibility of falling down these steps if they're not careful. Uh, we create health messages like this one to warn our members of our species about diseases that might uh, uh, befall them if they continue to use uh, cigarettes. Um, and as it turns out, all of these messages, these alarm calls in human beings, uh, over, the, over the years we've come to a sort of consensus about what they look like or maybe should look like. Um, the, the, the research on threat appeal suggests that every, um, every threat appeal, every alarm call, every warning ought to describe some danger. It ought to tell you what the problem is. Uh, it ought to describe that, what's been called a hazard. Uh, and generally speaking, there's two parts to that. Uh, we have to warn people about the badness of the thing, uh, the severity, if it's cancer or if it's uh, gingivitis or whatever it might be. Um, and we have to have, we have to tell them they're susceptible to it. Uh, often that's done in uh, health uh, terms and saying you have a 90% likelihood of this happening or a 60% likelihood, or sometimes this could just happen to you. Uh, and making that uh, dramatic component real, uh, the, uh, illuminating the possibility of the danger is part of the hazard component. So that's sort of where research is uh, on this part of the message. There's another piece, uh, the action uh, component, which directs people's attention as to the solution. How do you uh, move away from the hazard? How do you fix the hazard? How do you address it? And consensus again over the years is that uh, there's something called a response efficacy component, which is that if you do this thing, it will solve the problem. And there's a self-efficacy component, which is that you are able to do it. So in some previous research, um, for example, there's uh, uh, problems associated with uh, dental ill health. Uh, if you don't uh, brush your teeth and floss, you can get gingivitis. Gingivitis can lead to uh, inflammation around your gums, which you're going to try to cause your to recede, and your teeth fall out and it hurts. So that's bad, right? It's severe, and it can happen to you if you're not brushing and flossing enough. So what do you do? Well, if you just floss and just brush your teeth, you can eliminate almost all those problems. And here's how you do it. Get a toothbrush and do that, right? That's the self efficacy So that's where we are uh, with regard to sort of a, a field-wide consensus on what threat appeals look like right now. And that's the first piece. That's what we're going to hear about in the remainder of our time here. Uh, here's another uh, naturally occurring uh, threat appeal. This one, which is the hazard component, comes second in the action comes first. Um, this is an illustration. In fact, you don't have to arrange things in the hazard action component. Maybe you flip around as they have here. But you'll see also in this example that not every piece is specified. Uh, sometimes there are threat appeals that leave open the self-efficacy component or uh, part of the response efficacy component. They don't specify maybe exactly, there's no probabilistic terms of, of anybody going to hell, it's just an all or nothing thing. Um, and you have to sort of judge for yourself how bad you think that would be. Um, but there are every points, really, these warning messages. And they all show this, this combination of components, uh, sometimes filled in by context, um, but often those are uh, specified uh, explicitly. So I want to take you on a little tour uh, that involves looking at the history of threat appeals. I um, want to talk about some uh, research that my colleagues and I have been doing uh, in the recent, recent history, since about uh, 2014, and then turn attention to where uh, such things might go. So that's our, that's our roadmap uh, for what's coming up. 
Um, but let's go back. Let's turn the dial back to 1953 for now. Uh, we'll go to a small uh, high school in Connecticut uh, where Janice and Feshbach, uh, oops, the uh, two guys who did the first social scientific study of fear of field, um, uh, carried it out in this Connecticut high school and they advocated brushing your teeth. Now, brushing your teeth is said to be one of the great public health successes uh, in, in recent memory. Um, but in 1953, it wasn't a foregone conclusion that everybody was going to brush their teeth. It was still a matter of contention, and some people didn't think it was necessary. And there were warring camps. There was a group of people who thought you had to brush up and down. There was a side to side camp. Uh, and there was the brush, 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 you know. Uh, so it wasn't, it, you're talking about trying to persuade people to brush their teeth. At this point in history, it wasn't a foregone conclusion that everybody was doing that. Everybody thought it was a good idea. So Janice and Teshbach <coughs> tried to convince these folks that it was a good idea. Uh, and they did so by creating three different levels of threat appeal. A strong appeal which focused on pain from toothaches, and that pain was mentioned 11 times in the strong appeal. Only once in the moderate appeal and zero times in the minimal appeal. The messages uh, talk about having teeth pulled and cavities filled nine times, one and zero. Talk about mouth infections and inflamed gums 18 times, 16 times, and twice. You see some variation across messages. That strong threat appeal also included images of people's gums. Uh, some had been inflamed and they were pulled back and teeth were exposed and, and there was pus oozing out and it was pretty gross stuff. Um, the point being here, variation in the message, in the severity and susceptibility of the fear appeal, uh, strong, moderate, and uh, minimal messages. After a week, they went back to the high school, they asked the high school kids, have you been brushing your teeth? More or less, do you worry about it? Uh, and what you see here is that in the weak group, about 25% of them said they've been I'm sorry, there's about a 25% change uh, in terms of people brushing their teeth or doing some kind of dental health. Uh, they think it was better. Not much impact in moderate. Boy, 42% uh, of them were worried. Right? So here's, I'm not sure I spoke clearly there. This line here is all about worry. They asked them how worried they were the next week, uh, the weak, moderate, and strong condition. And what you see is that uh, the strong message created a lot more worry, sort of like fear. Uh, than did the, either of the other messages. They also asked the students what sort of uh, uh, dental health uh, activities they were engaged in, and they uh, assessed the percentage change in uh, brushing your teeth. And what you see here is that this, the weak message had a much more salutary effect than the moderate message and a much better effect than the strong message. That wasn't what we thought was going to happen. Um, Janice and Feshbach changed gears and said, well, how do we explain these data? This being the only study that had ever been, the only social scientific study that had ever been done at the time, uh, they were put upon uh, to try to explain these uh, counterintuitive data. And they did so with this. This is called their drive model of um, threat appeals. Uh, the idea here is that when you become scared, it energizes you and you engage in some random search behavior. Uh, if you're a pigeon in a cage, you just run around until you bump into the thing. Uh, but if you're human, you might encounter the end of the message, and the end of the message would say something like brush your teeth. So it would reduce that randomness and people would learn what they were supposed to do and carry it out. Uh, the interesting thing about the drive model was that they proposed this curvilinear hypothesis, which said that there's a sweet spot. Oops, uh, we need to. There we go. Someday I'll master this quicker. Um, there's a sweet spot here in the middle, which is that it's at the moderate level of fear appeals that will be the most persuasive. Uh, they suggest this is true because if you have a weak fear appeal, it might not convince you that the thing even matters. 
It's, uh, it's so weak, you know, so I don't brush my teeth. It's not a big deal. You didn't mention any bad outcomes. I'm not worried about it. Or it doesn't apply to me. So there's no hazard there, no perceived hazard, and consequently no reason to be persuaded. At the other end of the continuum, um, Janice and Feshbach suggested that what happens is you get so upset, <coughs> so anxious, and so nervous about the possibility you might experience uh, you know, gingivitis and gum disease and tooth decay and so forth, that the, the really pressing matter becomes managing your own emotion. This is so terrifying that I'm going to set aside all my concerns, run down to the hotel, have the OMG donut, maybe even two of them, to take my mind off of it. And that's going to fix everything I need fixed, which is just calming me down. So it's at the sweet spot there where you have that nice balance, they said, between being potent enough, and, but not so potent that it threw people off track. And honest to God, doesn't that sound like that's how it'll be? Doesn't that sound like truth? That's, I mean, that just, that's such a good idea. It resonates, and it resonated with undergraduate textbooks for decades. But let's look at what the social scientists said. In 1969, Kate B was the first person to review the threat of field literature. Uh, he did a narrative review, so he just read the articles and sort of interpreted what they meant. Um, he asked uh, the question, is the pattern in the data curvilinear? Does it show that up and down curve as predicted by the uh, drive model? And his conclusion was emphatically no. Uh, instead, he said, well, what the data show is that the more, uh, the, more, the, the more we scare people, the more they're persuaded. So a linear relationship, more fear, more persuasion, right? Well, so fast forward to 1982, meta-analysis has been invented, Sutton does a meta-analysis of 35 studies, 20 of which speak to the question of curvilinearity, linearity and he finds no evidence of curvilinearity, linearity but clear evidence that the relationship is more fear, more persuasion. Manjo, 98, 1998, 45 studies, same result. Not curvilinear, yes, it is positive and linear. More fear, more persuasion. Woody and Allen were now 98 studies. They didn't tell us how many they uh, analyzed for this, but they reached the same conclusions. And in 20, I think it's actually a 2016 study now, um, 248 effect sizes, equivalent to 248 studies on threat appeal since 1953. Wow, 248. We should know something by now. Right? Uh, and the same conclusion, right? It does, it's not curvilinear, yes, it's positive, it kind of taps out at the top, kind of flattens out at the top, is what they said. But it, from all those data, all those years, 1953, folks, lots of studies we should know by now, right? Maybe. Here's the data, summary of the data, uh, just to remind you. Um, that's what the theory predicted in red, and that's what the data showed in yellow. So, although we're driving in on the boulevard of threat appeals, let's take a little side road here and ask the question uh, about body mass and uh, life expectancy. What's the relationship between body mass and life expectancy? You all have an answer, okay? Increased body mass, decreased life expectancy. Okay. Uh, well, let me suggest there's a couple answers to this question, and that's certainly one of the uh, one of them. Here's life expectancy by body mass across three different species. I've only picked three to make it simple. There's mice down there. Uh, this is in pounds on the uh, x-axis, and years of age and death on the uh, y-axis. Mice don't live very long and don't weigh very much. Right? Quarter horses come in at about 1,250 pounds. They last about 30 years, and if you're lucky enough to be a blue whale, you're big and you live a long time. So that's not all the species in the world, uh, but that's the regression line. It looks kind of like the relationship between life expectancy and body mass. So we would conclude from these data a positive relationship. Right? One goes up, the other goes up. But let's ask about another random species, say Homo sapiens, for example. Um, 
these data are a little bit different. Uh, we're looking at body mass uh, across the x-axis and uh, the percentage of males who are alive at age 70. So what you see is that uh, the percentage of, alive ma at, of males at age 70 is about, I don't know, 78% if their body mass is 24. It goes down to maybe 65 if body mass is 32. And for body mass of 43 and above, uh, about 45% are still alive. So from this, we might infer that the relationship between life expectancy and body mass is negative. Now, these facts are not in conflict with one another. Right? These are two different questions. Um, and we don't have any problem accepting that the answer to the question of body mass and life expectancy might be different if we pose the question with these different constraints. Now I mention that to you because we might be in that situation with regard to drug use. We've done 248 studies, uh, but maybe they were only focused on one of these questions. Here again you see the same uh, pattern I showed you before, and let me emphasize uh, in ways that I probably didn't a moment ago, that when I say low, moderate, and high, we're talking about people who are assigned to different experimental conditions. There's the low threat message, and these people, all these people got the same message. There's the moderate threat message, the high threat message, and in each of those groups, we're using that to predict persuasion over here, and it produces that line or something roughly equivalent to that. That's our between species question. Or in other words, our between groups research design. We can ask the question about what happens within species, what happens within an individual at the moment they experience or process a threat of healing. And my colleague L.J. Shin's uh, insight was that if we do that, we can, we can also derive a curvilinear hypothesis. If you imagine an experiment uh, in which you're all brought into the health research lab, for example, um, you're told that uh, you're going to be part of a, uh, an experiment on uh, uh, dental health, and you're asked to respond to a questionnaire uh, in which you provide information about your own level of fear at this moment. Right? Uh, if you're like most people, there's nothing scary going on, and your numbers will be low. Um, but if after you hear about the new kind of flesh-eating bacteria that enters your mouth and works its way to kill you by you know, starting at your mouth and eating up to your brain and your heart, uh, you might find that you're more frightened than you were in the beginning. Um, and when you hear that you can, by taking this pill that will be administered to you at the end of your exam, uh, you can completely eradicate the chance that this uh, flesh-eating bacteria will harm you, your fear might decrease. So I show you these two things because even though they have the same curve, they're not the same question. Right? There's two variables here, low, low moderate, high fear and persuasion, and there's two variables here, timing of fear and fear intensity, but these are not the same. These are not the same graphs. These are not the same questions. Um, the, the second question, which we call drive model version two, relies on within person designs as opposed to between person designs. And it makes the prediction, or this makes the prediction fear causes persuasion. This model makes the prediction that fear over time, if it follows this pattern, predicts persuasion, which is not shown in this graph. So methodologically, we need to think about how we're going to study, how we're going to do this experiment, how we're going to take the data and analyze the data in a way that, that enables us to test this curvilinear prediction. It's a different curve. So let's go back to the simple case in which we have fear on the x-axis and persuasion on the y-axis. Um, we have uh, different people who report their level of fear, and you can see you know, fear is higher for this person than this person. 
uh, and we predict their persuasion. So to do that, we do simple regression analysis. We draw a line through there, and it estimates the degree to which fear predicts persuasion. Pretty simple thing. That's with our example of nine uh, people. So let's go to a different design, the within-person design, where we've got time, whoops, didn't do that yet. Uh, time down here, pre-message, post-hazard, post-action, measures of fear, and we have data for three people. So this first person, right there, uh, here's a message that says, eh, I don't believe it. Uh, you know, I'm not getting very, very, very nervous about this. This person says, well, maybe it could happen. And this person says, oh my God, um, I could be, you know, have my, be inside my brain now, it's got to be and they can't quite get over it. So different people produce different curves. And we want to know how to aggregate the data so that we can use it to predict persuasion. We can do it the same way. Uh, we can ask the statistical algorithm to draw a curve for us. And this curve uh, produce, produces, uh, this, I should say, these, this set of variables produces a number for a curve. You can think of that as a multiple regression that predicts this, uh, produces these predicted values, where A, is the y-intercept. It just moves the, the height of the curve up and down. Um, B is the uh, horizontal intercept. It moves the curve right and left, and sometimes it moves it off the axis so you don't get a full curve. You only get this much of the curve, this much of the curve. And the uh, uh, quadratic term uh, is the, the term that determines whether your curve goes down like this or for negative values or up like this for positive values. And at zero, um, if your line is flat, then your x squared is zero. So those three pieces of information allow us to take all the information within the curve and put it in a term which we can then use to predict persuasion. That's what we're trying to do. When LJ and I did the analysis, reanalysis of some older data uh, that had used this kind of experimental design, uh, what we found was that the, first of all, the experimental design um, produced this pattern of means, which is to say that people who were exposed uh, first have to give their uh, fear report before the message, it was low. Uh, when they heard the hazard portion of the message, they reported higher fear. And when they uh, heard the action component of the message, they reported lower fear. This had to do, this message was about um, getting a flu shot. Uh, and it was a study that was done in the fall. Uh, so it was sort of a, a timely moment. Um, we, can, we analyzed the variation in the curve and found that when we used the curve to predict persuasion, it predicted persuasion positively. So variations around the curve uh, produce more persuasion. Or in, in, in the, the nature of that variation was such that more peaked uh, curves produce more persuasion versus flatter curves which produce less persuasion. So there's our first indication that maybe this other way of thinking about fear fields and threat fields might have some validity drive model version 2 uh, might be something to think about. So that's where we've been. That was 1953 to 2014. Let's look at what's happened in the last three years. First thing we want to ask ourselves is, <clears throat> is the result real? We've got one study versus hundreds. Uh, you know, social science is never content to do just one study. Uh, in fact, we don't want that. We don't think that's a good thing. Uh, so we'd like to know the results are replicable. Uh, that's what we set ourselves to right away. We'd like to know, well, you know, if it is, and so what? Um, you know, it's got two curves and, you know, what tempest in a teapot or what? Um, and if, if it is really there and it matters, then how would we explain it? So that's what we've been working on the last um, three or four years. We did a study, um, we asked people who were aged 39 to 49, 
uh, about their intention to have a colonoscopy and presented them with a message that encouraged them to do so. Um, that pre presented exactly the kind of pattern we had hoped it would. Uh, we measured them before the message, after the hazard component, after the action component. Um, the curve predicted persuasion with a beta of 0.24. So some evidence there that um, the persuasive message uh, did in fact produce persuasion, this over time way of thinking about fear. And if you're in that age group, 39, 49, or post 49, you should have a colonoscopy. I mentioned that the Janice and Feshbach study was about dental health. Uh, we did another study um, on dental health, sort of to honor them, uh, match that across time. Uh, this study was a little bit different because we, uh, we had two different levels of fear. Uh, we had a high threat message that produced this stronger, this red curve, and a lower threat message that produced this uh, white curve. Um, what you can see from the beta weights is that the stronger, the, the more intense the message, uh, and uh, it's, uh, it, 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 has, it's, it has a stronger ascending and descending values, was a more persuasive message than um, the flatter message. Um, that's an important uh, point for us because this is the curvilinear hypothesis that says it's not enough to scare people. You have to also show them how to bring that fear down. Uh, and if you don't have sufficient fear, um, you're not going anywhere. Uh, and this study was uh, an illustration of that. Well. If you don't know already, social scientists love pretty pictures. Uh, and one has to ask, isn't this just another case of a social scientist having fallen in love with a pretty picture? Um, and it's a fair question to ask, um, because it's, we do like it. Um, I suggest to you that one of the things that is advantageous about drive model version 2, about the over time assessment of fear appeals, is that it's a much better representation of the true phenomenon. We don't have emotions in snapshots. They don't have an onset and an immediate offset. Emotions start, they peak, they fade. That's what really happens. So, this method of assessing them, uh, threat appeals over time, message processing, is a more realistic way of assessing what really happens with emotions. It's a more veridical representation of the thing we're trying to study, which is how does emotion uh, persuade. It's also the case that in the instances in which we have the big curve, the big peak, we get bigger effect sizes. Uh, than most of the other uh, between group studies. So it can give us the thing that we seek, which is better prediction of human behavior. It's also the case <coughs> that uh, this over time uh, dynamic approach to studying peer appeals tells us more about how to make messages. If you consider the between group studies, those um, uh, meta analyses, told us that the more fear you produce, the more persuasive you are. And that was it. So scare them as much as you can. And don't worry about the rest. The, the over time studies, the dynamic approach suggests that eh, that's not quite right. Uh, if you want to persuade people, yes, you have to maximize the amount of fear that they experience, but you also have to have an effective action component that reduces that fear. And if you have curves that look like this and don't reduce the fear, that's not going to be persuasive. So we learned something about how to make better messages. And that's communication science. But here's the rub. The original drive model was predicated on ideas that don't have much currency now. Um, the original model assumed that we were like pigeons in cages uh, searching for that food pellet, that we just exhibited this kind of random behavior. We experienced a threat and sort of like, oh, what do I do? What do I do? Um, that's 
Well, maybe. Maybe that happens sometimes. Um, but it overlooks the fact that, that we often think and we often act in non-random ways. Drive theory also assumed, drive theory was a variation on learning theory, in saying we had to learn all the stuff in the message if we're going to uh, then be persuaded by the message. And we know uh, from a lot of research now that learning the content of the message is not the best predictor of persuasion. Uh, better predictors include the things you think the message wanted you to to learn or your own responses to the message. What happens in here is what predicts persuasion, not the content of the message. So we know drive theory is wrong in that respect. And it assumes um, a pretty much total lack of agency. Um, human beings are not really much different than one cell organisms, according to learning theory. We're just stacked higher and deeper. Um, but all the essential principles of, of motion and change are the same for us as for one cell creatures. We react to noxious stimuli by moving away from them. We move to attractive, we move towards attractive stimuli. But we're not really much different than one cell organisms. Um, maybe, um, but I guess my own philosophy of humanhood is one that would like to grant more agency uh, to people who are being persuaded and suggest they might have some choice. Uh, in that process. So now, at present, um, we find ourselves in a position of having a clear pattern of data that might tell us more about communication science than the alternatives, but we don't have a good way to explain it. That's where alarm calls come in. There's a huge body of work on alarm calls and other species that we could mine uh, that might tell us something about how we work. Let me give you an example. Red dot on the screen, right? Focus your eyes on the red dot. Don't move. Keep your eyes on the red dot, no matter what happens. Ready? So, unless you're in a coma, your eyes followed that red dot across the screen, and you couldn't help it. Because that's the way we're built. And not just us. Insects, small mammals, large mammals, um, anything that moves uh, is attuned to the environment and changing the environment. Uh, that's the first thing that happened when the starlings see the sparrows, that there's movement. And we are all, we're built to track it because it's a potential threat. So there are studies of, of change uh, in, in lots of species, uh, and it shows exactly that thing. We, we give attention to things that move, uh, things that are different, uh, and it's wise to do so because they might be predators or they might be threats of other various sorts. But it's not just change. We also um, attend to things that might be relevant to us. So in the looming paradigm, what happens is that as I walk towards Jolly, she sees me getting bigger. Right? <laughs> uh, and that might be threatening. In the looming paradigm, uh, experimentalists have created situations in which something becomes bigger, it looms, it comes at you, uh, it grows in some it invades your space. Uh, in the earlier study, uh, it was done with uh, rhesus uh, monkeys, uh, one at a time, they put them in a room, a smaller room than this. But they showed them something, just a circle that came up, boom, and when it, it appeared to expand, as this one does, the monkeys kind of freaked out. Uh, they did this, uh, they ran away, they moved out of the way. Um, we don't know what they were thinking, uh, but they acted like this might be a concern to them. And when the researchers made the dot get smaller and go away, they stopped, they looked towards it, they went to the screen, um, and they begin to explore and express behaviors that seem not so threatening. So it may be obvious that's susceptibility, right? When it's changing and it's coming at you, that means you're, you're in, in the path of the threat. Um, there's a lot of literature on looming. Um, it shows that more rapid change causes people to, to give attention, more attention, and to allocate their attention more quickly. Um, it matters, I've shown you a big red dot, but it matters what the thing is. 
when the, um, the image that's coming at you is a spider uh, versus a butterfly, people uh, estimate the time at which you will come at them as much smaller for the spider. The spider is more threatening. It demands attention. It worries people more than the butterfly does. So there's semantic content, and that might be a sensible thing for us to think about, too. Some threats in the, in the messages that we describe are bigger threats than others, and we need to understand how they um, might influence people's assessment of threats. It's the case that when there is a collision course, uh, if the, the dot is coming directly at you, it's more frightening, uh, it causes more attention allocation, than if it looks like it's going to wing by you. So I could make that circle come up instead of being straight, it might be a little bit more like an oval, so it looks like it's going off your right shoulder, off to your, uh, your right shoulder, off to your left shoulder. Um, and that uh, it causes more rapid response times when it's dead on, of course. These studies have been done with auditory messages. When you're at uh, a theater with the THX sound, you can hear the helicopter come from over here and, and it goes over there. Um, people respond the same way when the sound's coming at them. Um, and there's evidence from uh, that not only they overestimate the intensity of the threat, uh, but you see uh, uh, reactions in uh, uh, galvanic skin response and uh, in those fMRI studies in the amygdala, which is thought to be, although we discussed the questionable, questionable these data are, uh, thought to be sort of the seat of, of fear. It's also, finally, uh, the last point of the living studies, uh, it's the case that when the, uh, the audiovisual material recedes, when it goes away, the train moves that way, the helicopter moves away, uh, that people attend to, they watch it leave, they begin to explore and uh, uh, exhibit other kinds of behavior, action-oriented behaviors, but not defensive behavior. So, let me give you where we are right now, and that's alarm call theory. Uh, just two propositions and a little piece to unite them. Um, the first of which is this. Uh, homo, sapien, homo sapiens possess an evolved threat detection module that's sensitive to direction, just as the circle is coming at you or not, to the semantic content. Um, I should say direction is, corresponds with the existing notion of susceptibility in the fear fields literature. Uh, semantic content is much like the uh, severity component of the fear fields literature. Um, what we don't see in the fear field literature is the concept of velocity, the urgency with which we're um, assessing this threat. And it might well be the case that we're not attuned to climate change because it's not very urgent or doesn't seem to be, hasn't until the last couple of years, uh, seem to be that we're not built to respond to it in the same way. It doesn't seem as urgent. Uh, not to argue that it shouldn't be. Um, it's also the case, and we know this today, only because you saw the slides of the birds <laughs> going away, is that birds worry about others than themselves, right? In social species, people don't give alarm calls because they need to hear the alarm call. They give alarm calls, birds and, and mammals of all sorts give alarm calls because the other members of the species need to be warned of this thing that's coming. So this is something different. This is saying that our alarm calls, threat appeals, the things that we make are there to warn other members of our species, something that we don't see in the uh, existing fears. So there's a threat detection module. <clears throat> it assesses all the bad things that might be happening. It outputs emotion. Emotion is a signal, an internal signal. Uh, it, is, it comes to consciousness and informs us of what to do, informs us that things are a problem. Different systems are assessing that there's a threat. Uh, you can see that this signal, this emotional signal, shows change. Uh, it comes about because of variations in content. It has particular meaning, and the meaning of fear is that there's a problem, heads up. We need to reprioritize attention and action. Uh, and the direction of the change tells us that the threat may be receding, or is there something that we can do to address that? 
So that's the piece that links us to action. Second proposition. Homo sapiens uh, have an evolved action detection or action module, a generalized action module, because you don't want to have a special sec uh, action module just for dealing with threats. That would be inefficient. We need to act in all sorts of ways. That uh, um, action module assesses uh, response efficacy and self-efficacy. Does it work and can you do it? Um, and is needed that response efficacy, that uh, action module suggests whether or not we should warn others. Um, we can scream, which we do um, uh, involuntarily, but we could also forward that tweet about the bad thing we just read about to the people that need to hear it. Uh, and that would be another way of warning our guns with some things. So where do we go with this? Um, that's an overview of the theory. Of course, not all the nuts and bolts, because that would, would be boring. Um, but we have, we have enough of it, I think, to see that we might ask some questions. Uh, for example, uh, wrong question again. We might ask about the effects of, of, sh of shape of the emotional signal. If we get more peaked or less peaked, we've already seen some of that. Um, but do different sorts of shapes have different effects on behavior? Uh, we have a quick study to show you about that one. This was uh, a study which we, we did with uh, students at Penn State. Uh, those of you who are undergraduates know that when you enroll, you're required to, maybe graduate students too, you're, you're required to report your health status and often provide documentation on a variety of different things from measles and meningitis. Um, but you might forget. Um, a lot of the, the kids did in our study. Uh, we wanted them to ascertain their uh, vaccination status with regard to their meningitis uh, protection. Um, and some of them do, uh, but many of them didn't. Um, the, the, the thing we tried to persuade them to do was go find out. Call your mom and dad, call your doctor, go check your health records, do some behavior, some information search behavior. They viewed a message um, that um, was of the same sort, it had an action component, a hazard component. Uh, but before viewing the message, we tried to simulate an environment in which a threat was out there. Um, there's lots of threats that are in the world right now. Uh, the uh, HIV AIDS uh, was a terrifying thing, and many communities were in a state of full-on fear all the time. Uh, until some of the um, uh, newer drugs have come online. Um, we're all, in, if you haven't had a flu shot yet this year, you're in a very low state of concern about that, uh, but it's part of the environment right now. So we tried to simulate that uh, using a horror film and a comedy film to elevate the level of fear uh, prior to the message or to ensure that the level of fear was low uh, we saw some people a clip from Chainsaw Massacre, which is a pretty gruesome uh, old horror show, and a comedy called Old School, which I didn't think was very funny about it. Um, as you can see, they produce two different kinds of curves. And once again, it's the curve that looks like an inverted U that is persuasive. Uh, and this other kind of curve, not so much. That's really important to doing health communication research, isn't it? If everyone's already scared, um, it's going to be hard to persuade them. We need to figure out new ways to do that, bottom line, of that study. Um, but again, you see evidence for the uh, inverted U and uh, not evidence for the alternatives. Um, the short work, different conditions, the curve predicted better than the non curve. So, what's the theory doing for us? What work does it do? What ideas does it give us? I think it causes us to ask some questions we couldn't ask with any previous theory. Do we need to ask, uh, be studying urgency? Um, probably we do. It, it seems like an obvious oversight in prior theory that we aren't asking, when is this threat going to happen to you? Um, can we study arrangement? Uh, in the uh, you're going to hell if you don't accept Jesus message, uh, you could see that the components were flipped. 
well, how does that uh, change in arrangement, a classic rhetorical question, um, produce different curves? And do those different curves uh, yield persuasion or not? We can ask questions about message dissemination because the birds are screaming at the other birds. Uh, and there's a reason for that. We're talking to other people. We're forwarding messages. We're designing the health messages that say if you smoke, you're going to cause cancer. And that's just an institutional level instantiation of the notion of warning is nonspecific. We can ask questions about repeated exposure uh, as well. But two quick points here. This is a theory or theoretical position that has implications for ethics. Um, and one of them is that um, it, people and other species don't necessarily use alarm calls honestly. Um, in all, all other species, uh, and certainly in the tufted capuchin monkey here, which you see sharing his teeth with us while he issues an alarm call, uh, this alarm call has been issued fraudulently. It's often the case that lower ranking members of the top of cappuccines will issue an alarm call because then the, the, the big guys who are eating the bananas run away and the lower ranking members of the troop get to have their share of the fruit. Um, if they do that often enough, the big guys come back and beat them up. Uh, so they, re they enforce honesty too uh, in some of the same ways we do, but they also cheat just like we do. Um, here's an example of that in Texas. Um, the uh, transgender bathroom debate uh, seemed to have no real uh, consequences, but boy, it sure got people frogged up. Um, I call that a deceptive alarm call. Um, the you can also ask on a more positive note uh, about responsibility. Public health perspective on fear appeals is you shouldn't do them. They're paternalistic. You're, it's too heavy-handed. It's not nice to scare people. Um, and they, so they're actually, the public health perspective on fear appeals is that it's just, you're somehow sub-optimal if you would even consider using a protective threat. From the perspective of alarm call theory, you ought to be warning other people. In fact, it's your responsibility to warn other people. Um, other members of your conspecifics, that's how we all protect the truth. That's the value of social living. Lots of eyeballs on potential threats enable the whole group to, to live a little longer. So we covered a lot of time today, folks, from 1953 to the present. We did, we covered the past, we covered the present, we covered the future. That's all I got. <laughs>
until um, until recently. In fact, well, I could say it's still in use, and I'm still trying to overcome it. That's my personal failing. Uh, I'd like to see us go back to talking about threat appeals because it doesn't involve the implicit assumption that if you make this message, it's going to work. It's clearly false. Um, you still see um, studies, in fact, most of them still, uh, the titles of their papers are fewer appeals do this or fewer appeals do that. Um, I'd like to go back to public language, but I haven't uh, achieved it in myself yet. Um, I'm still overcoming habit. Um, but I very much subscribe to the idea that the threat in the message is different than the, uh, the fear that it might cause. So thank you. Yeah? Come on. So, so I don't know if somebody questions that does your theory only take into account messages that will lead to appraisals that will go to fear? Because I'm an interview scholar and I study threat too, but I also look at threat messages that might lead to other cognitive appraisals that would lead to different emotions like anxiety, like anger, like disgust, and those we know have different um, um, behavioral outcomes. So I'm wondering. Oh, okay, another great terminological question. Um, so the, the word threat means a lot of different things. Um, it can mean threat to identity. Uh, it can mean threat, I'm about to hit you. Um, but in the, in the uh, threat appeals literature, I almost did it, uh, threat appeals literature, it means some threat to your well-being. Uh, usually some threat that, that I'm not in control of, but is out there in the environment. Uh, it's typically what it means. But it might mean uh, threat to freedom in reactance theory. Uh, as a threat too. Uh, and so when I'm talking about threat appeals, I want to limit it to the appraisal that harm might be done to me or my con specifics uh, and not to my identity or to my freedom or uh, I don't know, any other ways in which threat you. It's too big a word, um, but we're stuck with it. Thanks, those are important points of clarification. Uh, Samantha. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, I had a question in the drive model um, within the with in person design, right? There's three different time points in the last post action. I'm curious is that after the person receives the part of the message, does it tell them what to do? Or is that after the person actually takes action? So, for example, hearing that you need to get a colonoscopy versus actually going to get a colonoscopy. Thanks. In our studies, um, we have found that these examining fear appeals is really virtuous in this regard because you can clearly say in most fear appeals, here's the hazard component and here's the action component. So we measure once before, measure fear once before there's any message at all. We show the action component, we measure fear again. We present the, uh, sorry, I just said that one week, but we do one pre-message measure, we do the hazard component and then fear. We do the action component which says, here's how you brush your teeth and here's why you should do it and it's going to work. And then we measure fear again. Later, in the case of the meningitis study, for example, we went back a week later and asked them, did you go find out? Uh, and that, we didn't measure fear at that point, we just measured what did they do. So our over time is, you know, about five minutes. Right? Thank you. Hi. Hi, my name is Do you study this at all in terms of campaigns? That is, what happens um, after the message, uh, and after you found it, time going by makes a huge difference in the effect of the message. So I just wondered what are the implications for the study of, say, a long-term campaign? Well, that's a huge and important question. Um, we have not. We have been very focused on the moment at which the message is processed. Um, and we have not done studies, although I hope to, in which we would expose people to multiple messages on the same uh, topic and make the same message or maybe variations on the message. Because I have to think that um, 
the emotional response becomes more muted over time. Um, but how you deal with that, I mean, the, the function of emotion over time ought to be to get you to pay attention. Um, to, to, okay, I've decided now I'm going to get the colonoscopy because that doesn't scare me. Uh, I'm going to put it in my calendar. And when I go look at my calendar, I don't re-experience the full-fledged fear again. Or even if I see the same message, it may not be as potent. Uh, but it moves me to do that thing. So emotion functions not just as a motivator uh, for action, but as a motivator for learning. But the, the curve, I think, probably gets flatter uh, with repeated exposure. And I'm dying to know. Um, but I don't yet. Maybe my next visit to Maryland 10 years from now, I'll have that answer. I, I see big implications in, in political communication. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's a fascinating situation there because you have um, not just repeated messages, but messages from multiple sources that often tend to or desire to keep the emotion going, anger or the fear. Um, that's a, a really important, and I wish I had the answer. <laughs>